news, uh, I don't know if it's good news or not, but uh, the Woods Hole group came around on Monday before the King Tide and they were shooting elevations of all of the buildings, residential mm -hmm. or commercial, that touch the Inner Harbor or Reed Park or Masconoma Park. Uh, and that would include the condos on Beach Street and the train station and Crosby's, uh, as well as the homes right around uh, Ashland and, and uh, Central Streets. Uh, so we'll have really good data about how bad things are going to get. <laughs> yeah. So let's uh, come to order. This is the January 24th, 2020, January 25th, 2023 meeting of the Water Resource Protection Task Force. And uh, I'm glad you're all here. Uh, thank you for your work and for attending. Um, I have no uh, announcements except to say that the meeting is being uh, conducted online and uh, with public participation and any votes we conduct will be by roll call. It's also being recorded and um, please don't use the chat function for uh, anything substantive because it doesn't enter the minutes. Just reserve it for technical questions. I uh, perceive that a quorum is present so um, let's start. Anyone have any announcements or Anything to say before we kick off here? Okay, then uh, John Round and I can report on a update I delivered to the select board um, eight days ago. Um, I will admit that I thought the meeting started at seven, so I arrived about 10 of, and it had started at 6.30. So there was a noticeable amount of impatience, um, but, um, I sped up, and uh, I think that that uh, meant they could stay on track. We made good use of the time gap, Steve. Not a problem. Oh, good. <laughs> I figured you didn't just sit there waiting. No, no. <clears throat> In any event, what I attempted to do there was uh, kind of prepare the ground for the possibility that we'll have some uh, extensive and um, maybe in some cases, dramatic findings and recommendations. And uh, I think you've each received a copy of the slides I used, which are pretty, um, I, I did not say a whole lot more than what's on the slides in order to, to move quickly. So there was a refresher, reminder of what they had seen back in September about usage patterns and, and segments. <laughs> and uh, Manchester's kind of, um, undistinguished record as among the worst in uh, per capita water usage, uh, summer increase versus winter and uh, water loss unaccounted for water. Um, and I think the, the key thing in my mind anyway, was to show them that there will be between, you know, eight and 12 primary recommendations, which will cover uh, conservation and demand, they'll cover contaminants, they'll cover supply and potential new sources, and they'll cover the whole issue of, of responsibility going forward so that something can happen. So any questions or, or comments about that? Anybody get a chance to look at it? Want to say anything? I will say, Steve, that the uh, select board, uh, they, were, they were quite pleased with the presentation. It was one of the better presentations that they've had because they could follow it. They understood where it was going and what the conclusions were. And they were quite supportive of the direction we're going in. Well, I should say quickly that I had almost nothing to do with that. That's the uh, effect of having John Round simplify everything that I was planning to say. So we we spoke in plain <laughs> English <laughs> for most I think of the I, time. I think I gave you a certain number of minutes, as I believe that. Yeah, you know, there was that. I, but was things I'm like instead of, of saying our GPDPC is excessive, uh, we we said Manchester uses a lot of water, <laughs> and and I think that that is a kind of a bellwether of how to make the recommendations uh, easier to understand and deal with. Um, and we'll talk about that later. Yeah, I was pleased by the you know the lack of sort of what what do you think you're doing kinds of questions uh, because 
I think there was a perception that we've done a fair amount of homework collectively, and therefore uh, our findings are not just uh, not just strong opinions uh, on our part. Uh, the the um, recommendation that uh, occasioned probably the most immediate pushback in questions had to do with the possibility of a of a strat a strategy a strategic reconfiguration of supply, which would involve planning to retire the Lincoln Street well, provided we can replace it with an equivalent well of higher quality, cleaner water. Presumably, it would be near the treatment plant. Um, either the abandoned well uh, the, that's uh, further around Round Pond, so-called term RP2, or uh, something near that. And that, that kind of significant change in the idea that we would actually choose to retire a very productive source of water that we've enjoyed for over I don't know, 100 years or something, uh, that was difficult at first blush. Is that fair, John? Yes, no, I, I, I agree. I mean, that's a, it's a medium to long-term strategy and it is kind of shocking to them. I mean, it's shocking to some of us when we think about that. That was not necessarily on the table three months ago, but uh, it is yeah. now and well, the DEP may be a driver for all of that, we'll see. Yeah, yeah, there, there have been some significant um, consequential questions. Uh, the main one, which is how to maintain sufficient water pressure in the outlying areas, particularly in East Manchester, which already has trouble, especially on the higher uh, elevations like up Magnolia Avenue. Um, and we'll lose a fair amount of pressure if the Lincoln Street well isn't pumping water directly into the mains as it does now. Okay. Steve, it's Tom um, Keo. Yes, Tom. I think I, the other thing I think is, you know, that not hundreds of people attended that meeting, but uh, I thought the coverage on the front page of the uh, cricket was good and gave a good, um, good report of of your report and and what what information was spread to the board of selectmen. Yep, I yep. thought so too. Although Erica was a little bent out of shape because she had understood that the presentation was a week later. So she was um, off her game. On the other hand, she did a great job with the materials. Okay, let's turn to our, uh, our valuable consultants. Uh, Scott and Dana are here with us tonight. Unfortunately, we're, we're, uh, we're free from grad students. That was a pleasure last last time. Thank you. Um, uh, Scott, do you want to introduce and tell us what you have for us tonight? Sure, I'll be brief. Um, well, I guess a couple of potential things, but one for sure, and that is Dana is going to give us an update on the second round of thermal study um, and talk a little bit about how it compares to what she did the first go around, and then I may jump in later and talk about how that compares to other work we're doing. I think it's my my preface is I think it's all lining up where we kind of suspected it would, but um, I don't want to steal any Dana's th thunder. She's got some uh, slides if she can be enabled to show. I think Dana. Yeah. Take it. Away. It should be all set. You just uh, choose to share. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I'm going to go through uh, the brief summary of what, what was done with the most recent thermal st study, the aerial thermal uh, study, and present some of the findings, but not a, an exhaustive uh, presentation, just to give you a taste of, of what's uh, happened. Uh, and as Scott said, I'll compare that to the field work that was done in September, and then there'll be a more uh, detailed report that'll come out once all these photos have been um, thoroughly reviewed and, and we have a final report to present. Right. <clears throat> 
So we took uh, over 60 um, photos uh, at 200 to 400 feet above the surface of the pond, um, mostly around the edge of the pond. Um, and not only infrared photographs, which will sense heat, uh, were taken, but also uh, regular color photos were taken so that we could compare the IR pictures to the, uh, the, the real on the ground view of things. So we make sure we're not getting any um, noise or, or things that, that may change the way we interpret certain photographs. Did and that was, excuse yeah. Me, but would you back up just a step and remind all of us sort of why you are trying to figure out where there are temperature differences? Sure. Um, so the, the idea is that there's a contrast between the groundwater temperature and the surface water temperature. Um, and depending on the season, the groundwater is either warmer or cooler than the surface water temperature. It stays pretty much at a constant temperature somewhere between 50 or uh, 55 degrees Fahrenheit, which works out to be in 12 to 14 degrees uh, centigrade. So um, those, that's what we're looking for is that contrast in temperature. Um, in the fall, uh, the temperature of the groundwater was uh, cooler than the surface water. This time of year, when we're almost at uh, freeze up on the pond, the groundwater is going to be a warmer temperature than what we see in the pond. So Thank you for bringing that up. Um, that's a good way to preface this. So this is a, uh, a map showing where those locations were around the pond. Uh, we started on the south side uh, and did the photos in a clockwise fashion. And that was uh, mostly to follow the sun. We wanted to make sure that we mostly had photos that were in the sun. We didn't want to have some that were in the sun and some that were in the shade just to make sure we had consistent um, conditions. So one thing to keep in mind when we're looking at these photos that you'll see in the next few slides is that the temperature color, the, the scale is, is approximate number that we can say, yes, that's three degrees, that's five degrees, et cetera. Um, in general, the, the lighter colors, the yellow white color is the warmest temperature um, and the dark blue are the coolest temperatures. And this will be really apparent when you see these dark blue temperatures because there is ice covered near the shoreline in several areas. So it's really clear that those are the coldest areas. Um, if we have time, I'll also show a video that we took from the air of the, the settling pond discharge um, at the north end of the pond. So here's an example of one of the photographs. Um, and in each slide that I'm going to show you, there's a yellow X that locates the rough location of this photo. And I've tried to orient the the color IR photo in a way that is the same orientation as uh, what we see on the map. So um, what we're looking at here is the pond in yellow. The pinkish purple area is the tree cover. Um, and this is the shoreline where the cursor is following. And there's some open um, canopy here that, that's that's relatively warmer, but this is on land. So this edge, we have a couple of areas where we're getting this warm or warmish uh, color, which has been interpreted as areas of warmer water contribution to the pond. So we're seeing that here and we're seeing that to a certain extent in this inlet as well. And then in the upper right corner, you'll see this. This is a scale that um, Dave Cody from CEI, who actually did the drone work, um, and I came up with 
to give us a relative sense of what the temperatures we're looking at. And this is in Celsius um, with the coolest temperatures, again, this dark, dark blue and the warmest temperatures, the, the yellow white. All right, this next cove um, is where the yellow X is over the lower, uh, or the western part of the pond. There's a, there's a nice little cove here, as you can see. Um, the area of this uh, inlet is relatively warmer than the, the, the uh, water that you, that's closer to the center of the pond. And we're also seeing another area of uh, what I've interpreted as, as inflow of groundwater towards the pond. And then again, we're seeing this more warm areas on land. This is another open canopy where we have some exposed ground here, which is giving us a warmer temperature. All right, here's one of the areas of ice, and it's clear to see how cool the water is in this location. Um, this uh, area, here's where the, the photo was taken roughly in this area. We've got the island here and the shoreline. And then this is ice cover. And when you look at the photograph, you can see this clear line of where this ice is. So this is giving us a good delineation of what we're seeing there. This area is, is cool. Um, there doesn't appear to be any uh, inflow in this area. This is another area that's pretty dramatic. Uh, this is near the, the water treatment settling ponds. Um, here's a photo, an aerial uh, IR photo of the, the, the treatment ponds. And right along this cove, this, this is actually uh, closer to the pond, this photo taken right at the edge of the pond. And there's a, a pretty clear area of uh, warmer water here. And right at the shoreline, uh, area of warmer water, which um, interpreting as groundwater inflow towards the pond. And this could be enhanced somewhat by the water that's being recharged through the bottom of the settling ponds. Okay, and one last picture. And as I said, there's a lot of photos. I'm not going to go through them all tonight, but I am going to sum them up quickly. Um, this is the last uh, set of photos um, that I'll show you. And again, this is at the edge of the pond up by the north side where the, the round pond, the settling pond is. And here's a photo of the pond, obviously pretty warm. Groundwater is uh, being pumped in here. And then the discharge point is right where this arrow is. And you can see there's quite a bit of uh, warmer areas right along the shoreline. And here's a, another uh, photo that, that shows this kind of uh, plume, so to speak, of this warmer water that's emanating from the shoreline. So hopefully this is gonna work. This is a, a video that was taken at that discharge point. And you know, this is more just to show you what this uh, can do, but it also shows you know, how effective this is to show you this changing temperature. So look at this discharge point where my arrow is. Um, and we'll, yeah, we're getting a better view here. So it's very clear how that water is flowing out into the pond and um, how that's mixing with the pond water. So I still wouldn't say this is as warm as a lot of the areas that we saw uh, groundwater discharge, uh, but it, it's clear that it's a, it's a nice gradient there. Okay, so this is a summary that might be a little bit uh, hard to follow, but I'll do my best to explain it. Um, the, if you remember the, the first presentation after the field work in September, um, 
there was a, a range of colors that were representing the, the water temperatures that we sensed in the probe um, that uh, uh, was advanced at the shoreline. And at that point, again, the cooler water was interpreted to be the groundwater and the warmer water was less um, groundwater contribution. And those are shown here on the edge of the pond where they were measured. And then this time um, for the December survey, um, at this point, I just assigned a number, relative number of cool to warm um, temperatures based on the IR photography. And the, I'm interpreting the groundwater to be the warmer of the colors. So we had pretty good correlation over here where we saw the, the, the groundwater inflow um, on this uh, wet east side of the pond. And again, we had our really clear uh, definition um, close to the, the settling pond area. Um, we also had uh, pretty warm water that was sensed here, both uh, back in September and um, more recently. So that is a nice correlation of results. And then the two areas that were um, high as well, this cove here hadn't been surveyed at all previously, but uh, this came up with a, a, a pretty strong signal of groundwater uh, inflow. Um, so everywhere where we have three, there's really clear groundwater inflow. Um, and where we're seeing twos, it's still inflow, but less of a signal. Um, but I would say overall, um, you, you are able to see the impact of the um, groundwater discharge to Gravelly Pond in several areas, including this western side, which could uh, be representing a lot of the contribution from Round Pond as it as it influences um, a recharge to Gravelly Pond, as well as this side of the pond where we know we've got this higher elevation with a large accumulation of stratified drift and groundwater discharge to this area. Excellent. So that's uh, a summary. Um, we've got the general agreement, as I said, um, several areas not surveyed in September also showed groundwater discharge areas. We've got pretty good correlation with the areas of stratified drift, especially where we don't have them um, surrounded by the, the thin till or bedrock outcrops. And um, if needed, there could be additional field verification. Um, in, uh, in field measurements. And I also reached out to uh, a professor a friend of mine at UNH who has students that are doing quite a bit of uh, thermal imaging about interest in doing some work there if there seems to be any interest on the part of the task force or uh, the town to do additional work here. So be happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. And let's open the floor to questions or comments. I was, I was just gonna make one comment, Steve. Uh, Dan, if you go back to the slide that showed the two different survey, yeah, thank you. So just keep in mind here, the, the trick of looking at this is, um, the, the correlation is that the cool spots in the fall, um, September, would indicate groundwater discharge, whereas the warmer uh, spots now. So, so it's kind of like you got to <laughs> get to think inversely here when you look at this. Just want to yeah. make that clear. I think, I think, I mean, you did mention that, but it's a little tricky. So, because when when you first start looking at it, you say, wait a minute, the warm parts don't line up here. Yeah. But that's, the, the the intent is the warm parts now should line up with the cool parts from earlier. Yeah. So, I just want to clarify that. Thank you, Gordon. What what do you got? Thank you. Um, that was a great presentation, Dana. Thank you so much. Um, the picture that you showed near the settling ponds was really kind of striking. And I guess I'm I'm curious now if there's a way um, we can determine how much of that could be coming from settling ponds versus um, coming from things 
further away from the settling ponds, like the, the landfill, um, it looks really, that plume on the, on the middle image looks really, really localized to sort of the area of the settling ponds, which gives me great hope that maybe it's water that we're putting in there and not water from the groundwater and the, and the landfill. Um, but I guess I'm wondering, like, do people ever like put a tracer in the water and see if it ends up, uh, you know, down the hill there, or are there ways that we can we can figure that out? Yes, well, uh, yeah, you can certainly put uh, some non toxic tracers in and and look at that sort of thing. I would say that there's there's pretty good uh, chance that you're getting a treatment pond. Uh, influence there in that area. I mean, it's definitely permeable anyway, so you're going to have that groundwater coming in from the east anyway, but because you're actually adding additional water, it's basically mm -hmm. an area of artificial recharge, if you want to think of it that way. Mm -hmm. So I think that there is some water that's probably pushing through from the bottom of those settling ponds, and that could be just enhancing the groundwater signal we're getting on this side. Thanks. The other, the other comment I'd add, Gordon, it's a good suggestion. Uh, just keep in mind groundwater flow velocities and doing tracer studies. About a foot per day is a good rule of thumb. So 100 feet, three months worth of flow. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, you have to be patient. <laughs> yeah, Gordon, I mean, if you were looking at a leak on the bottom of a, of a, a you know, a line pond, it would be a whole different matter. Mm -hmm. That would go pretty quickly. Uh, as uh, Jeff Koshan can can uh, confirm this or or uh, detail it, but there is a specific area down gradient from the settling ponds where the where water is kind of concentrated Coming out of this. Yeah. as it comes down the slope. Mm -hmm. uh, so it may be that you know groundwater is arriving, you know, surfacing before it reaches the pond. It could also be that there's just a whole lot of sheeting there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the actual, there's a discharge point, I believe, a little north of here um, that, that's actually some of the overflow, I believe. Um, yep. This is representing, you know, groundwater. And, um, just to confirm this, Chuck or Nate, those ponds are used um, for backwashing, filters, um, what else? Yeah, just to filter backwash yep. on at the treatment plant. So every so often we have to basically use finished water uh, and cycle it back through the existing filters to take out all the impurities and basically renew the filters. And that's where that discharge goes and then everything settles out. And then every, you know, six to seven years, we clean the settling ponds and take all those solids and take them to a landfill. Mm -hmm. Got it. Thank you, Jeff. You had a question. Um, Dana, can you or Dana, can you go to the the map of the the whole pond that shows the regions around it? I'm wondering if it's not coming from those settling ponds. Yes, but it's not coming from those settling ponds. And you just look at this. Do we have a decent idea of where it's coming from, or could it be coming from half a mile away or a mile away? Is it coming from Maple Swamp to the south there? Like, how can you tell that? Well, without knowing exactly what is below the surface, um, it it's difficult to to really pinpointed, but this is a large deposit of sand and gravel here, which is, you know, absorbing a lot of water. It's um, allowing that to recharge into the sand and gravel and clearly flowing to the west. So whether or not it's Maple Swamp is influencing it or not, um, you, you do have this area of um, higher permeability material that that is uh, able to um, transmit quite a bit of water through the sand and gravel. So, so it could be it could be not rainwater 
dripping through that as opposed to maple swamp kind of pushing underneath it? Is that as possible as anything else? Yeah, I mean, I would say that it's it's certainly the, all the water sources on that side are going to contribute to that inflow, but um, you probably have a, a greater amount of recharge in the sandy material. I think Scott put together, you know, uh, some slides on this and and has it within his report where. He's attributing a, a larger recharge amount to the sand and gravel deposits as opposed to wetlands. There's certainly going to be connectivity, but um, to a lesser extent than uh, through the sand and gravel or the till material. Thanks. Yeah, Steve, I've got when we finish up this, I can show a couple of those slides. It might be helpful. Yeah, it might be helpful else. now. I have a question for, for both Dana and Scott. Which is what? What about these combined results surprises you? Um. Well, there are a couple of places where it looked like we didn't have much going on. That that there was a little bit more of a signal than than I expected. Um, so certainly on this western side of the pond, there was more coming in here than we originally expected to see. Um, um, other than that, uh, I don't think there's a, a huge amount of surprise. Um, there was less than I would have expected in this area um, around the marsh. This is the island. It doesn't really show up in this map. But this is where that large island is. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's pretty rocky, so you wouldn't expect anything there. But I was, I would have, I was surprised that there wasn't more apparent groundwater inflow in this area. But other than that, those were the only things that really stuck out to me to be, you know, different than I would have guessed mm -hmm. from looking at the geology. Gotcha, thank you, that's helpful. And am I, am I remembering right that the area on the west that showed relatively warm water? This area? Uh, the part that's closest to Round Pond. It's also an area that has a lot of marsh grass and muck in those uh, those coves. There is, and there's uh, drainage features here too. So there's probably you know connectivity through those drainage features. So a lot of surface water has um, more permeable material underneath the stream because it's you know transmitting water through the bed as well as in the stream itself. Okay, thank you. That's helpful because I remember when uh, Jeff was going around trying to add to the inventory of, of uh, sampling in the summer to September. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a particularly daunting area. In fact, we, we let him do that by himself because it was sort of <laughs> up to the middle of his thigh in muck. Right, right. I have a... a, a a layman theory to be shot down. Um, I think the water was probably about five feet higher in the, on December 20th than when we were first out there. And I wonder if that Western inflow was because of that heightened round pond area and mm -hmm. maybe the Eastern inflow previously was just reliant on that five feet lower groundwater. Hmm. Interesting, that would not surface not. water create some more like hydrostatic pressure? That's what I was thinking. Jeff, I want to make sure I understand you said, so the water level was higher recently, correct? Uh, I, 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 I was not out there on December 20th. Yeah. I don't know. Dan yeah. would know better than me how much higher yeah. it was, maybe Steve. It was we quite were, a bit higher, yeah. Yeah, I we don't were know impressed. Five feet, but yeah, it was definitely uh, a lot higher. Water. Two or three feet. So I'm gonna I'm gonna offer two things, and then and then Chuck and Nate probably have may have more to add. One is first of all, naturally the groundwater levels uh, are higher in December than they would be in September. Um, the, the low, although we're kind of on the shoulder of the low time. The low time is really October, early November. So we're starting to get, um, you know, 
more recently. What was the actual date? Um, I'm sorry, Dana, I don't remember the survey. The 20th of December. What, 20th of December? Yeah. yeah, so we're getting even through a good hunk of December. So that's one factor. And, and I'm all guessing the demand is lower in December. So the pumping, uh, you know, you're not pumping as much water out of the, out of the reservoir. So the water, it, it allows it to recover. Um, so I guess those would be the re and so on the first reason, um, the ponds higher, but the groundwater levels were probably higher too. Um, so the groundwater discharge may still be occurring, even though the pond is higher, I guess is one of my points. And that's, that's really a theory because we don't have, uh, not that I'm aware of, we don't have any groundwater levels, um, unless we have a way to take levels in like, uh, on pond two, but um, or other monitoring wells, but that's my guess as to why that might have happened. And I, I don't think it means there's not as much groundwater discharge, I guess, is what I'm suggesting. Yeah, I can just visualize more water being pressed in from the western side than when it was super, super dry in September or whenever we did that. Yeah, could be, could be. Okay, other questions or comments? Excellent, excellent report. Thank you, Dana. Thanks. And uh, look forward to getting a, a write-up we can share uh, with the select board in the town. Sounds good. Uh, Scott, did you want to show a couple of slides from I, your- I can show a couple of slides very quickly. I don't want to repeat too much from what we did before, but some of this you might find interesting. Oops, uh-oh. I've got too much on my desktop here. Hold on. How can, how can you tell? <laughs> see that? You can see that uh, map, I presume. So um, I'm in the process of putting a report together. I just want to show a couple images that might relate to some of the stuff we're talking about. Um, this is a 1893 USGS map of what was then called Gravel Pond right here. And um, you can also see Round Pond, Chebacco over here. You can see a connection between Round and Chebacco. Uh, by the way, there were no airplanes in the sky back then, so this is all done by ground survey. Um, and uh, the details were actually pretty amazing uh, that they were able to get this, get this together. Um, the one thing I noted is this this line here is a, is a contour, a topographic contour of equal elevation. You can kind of see it kind of wraps around the southern southeastern part of gravel pond or what's now gravelly pond and and the fact that this is connected here and if you look regionally tobacco connects to the northeast and to the the north drainage basin so i guess my if i had to theorize about what was going on back then that, that, that the gravel pond is there's no inlets and outlets shown here anyways but the groundwater is probably moving into the pond from the surrounding area but then moving out this nor flowing northerly would be my guess, uh, just based upon what I'm seeing here with the with the contours and the connections, and and that may have been a more a little bit more of a natural situation before the pumping started occurring. Um, this is a 1956 image of the same area again USGS, um, and it does show elevations of these four ponds. So we can see 45s here, 44 is there. So that does suggest the hydraulic gradient heading northerly. And again, we see this connection between Round Pond and Chebacco. Um, we also see a little bit of a connection through here. Looks like wetland here and stream. Uh, a little unclear as to how, how detailed of a connection that is. And then if I go to the most recent map, which is 85, and this might get to part of what you were talking about, Jeff. Um, just to kind of compare things we now we see a pretty clear connection between round pond and gravelly we still see that connection and then his uh, the maple swamp over here and it looks like it looks like that's flowing northerly and just charging into tobacco lake here um there's a contour here that sort of suggests ground uh, excuse me surface water in this case flowing kind of northwesterly so at least part of it looks to me like part of the maple swamp I can't say all of it, but certainly the part that's shown here looks as though it has a, a northerly gradient towards um, tobacco. Um, but I think your questions are still valid questions, and I don't think we we know. Uh, certainly, there could be some influence between those wetlands and the 
superficial geology deposits that Dana was talking about here. Um, I'll just quickly, uh, I don't know if you can, let me just show you a couple other images, then we come back to that. Um, and at these, this is a repeat, um, Cynthia Kwan, and I've referenced here, here, don't steal your students' work without giving them credit. Um, this was the map I showed, she showed you at the last meeting, as you may recall, what we're calling option A, the watershed to gravelly pond, and then option B, which includes the round pond, which is the one that I'm favoring and suggesting that we use here. And I'll, I'll clarify that in the report, which is under draft right now. Um, I guess the thing that I wanted to throw out, as especially as we talk about adding new sources out here, I, I said this before, and I think I showed you this slide before. Um, this currently gravelly pond under a natural condition, groundwater flows into it in most cases. As we add the round pond well, we start taking some groundwater. This is the way I think about it. We're taking groundwater into from that well that would have flown into gravelly pond. So these we can't think of these as completely additive is my point and then at some point it, it, that you could pump the ground pond well enough i think potentially we're actually inducing flow from the pond back into the well that's called induced infiltration so those are some situations we need to be continue to be mindful of as we talk about potentially pumping more water out of that area and um certainly adding another um another well and then here's the map Kind of from further away, these are the two wells, Round Pond three, uh, one and two, and then this is the larger, so-called Zone Two area that was mapped by Kemp Dresser McKee here uh, that contribute to those wells. So that's the protection area that goes with those. And then I think I've got one last image that's a close-up that kind of shows, uh, in this case, our option A in conjunction with the Zone Two boundary. And ultimately, I think that's going to be the map that I'm going to suggest um, the town consider using for uh, protection and management purposes. Uh, this well again does show this map again does show the two wells. And my only thought here is if if in fact this is considered as a future source to add to the system, um, then I'm not sure there. I, I, I did some calculations that I mentioned before about safe yield of gravelly ponds somewhere around 0 0.5, 0 0.6 MGD. As you add pumping here, I'm not sure that that 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7 for gravelly pond alone are, will still be there because, because of this cross section. We're taking water uh, from the same source. So this is just something we need to be mindful of. Um, we don't have a model that can that can uh, clarify exactly how much water gets pumped from the well versus gravelly pond, how that would affect it, but there's clearly um, overlap. And I think maybe I'll leave it at that. I don't think I've got any other images that I can show here. Um, well, that's 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 the option B, I think, with the um, the, the the at least this section of the zone two area. Um, and I think that's it. Um, I won't get into the rest of this. These are some of the safe yield calculations that I think I presented before in terms of how much water likely goes into the gravelly pond. And I think it's 0 0.5, 0 0.72 mm -hmm. groundwater contribution. And again, just to kind of maybe say it in a different way, as we pump round pond well, that's some of the same water. So we can't add it to it in terms of a long-term safe yield. And I guess I'll leave it at that, Steve. That's a lot of quick information. No, a helpful, helpful reminder of that stuff. Thank yeah. you, Scott. Yep, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't have any Jeff, questions on the maps. Jeff, your hand is up. Can you go to the uh, Round Pond 1 and Round Pond 2 map, the last map that you had? My question is, Round Pond 2 well there is on the opposite side of Round Pond from Gravelly. My, I, I wonder if that would actually draw from gravelly. It seems like round pond two would draw from round pond, not gravelly. That's true. But again, remember that round pond and gravelly pond are connected via groundwater at a minimum. Um, so it's, it's, it's part of the same system, but you're right, Jeff, it's a good point. It's further away. And frankly, the further away it is from gravelly and round pond one, the less interference is the term we use between those sources would occur. So that's you're, make, you're making an excellent point. Um, 
what I'm saying is still true, but perhaps less so because of where it is further away. Um, so yes, good point. And I, I should also add at some point, we, <laughs> we, we start talking about Beck Pond as part of the system as well. Right. Uh, Scott, I, this may be a question for Nate or, or Chuck, but I know you've looked at some of the historical uh, levels and uh, drawdowns and precipitation data in, in building your model. Yeah. Did you see any data that goes back to show the actual uh, yield from the abandoned well, round pond two, we're calling it? Um, let's see. I thought I had it in here. That's why I'm scrolling through, but I guess I didn't put it in yet. I don't remember if it includes the, um, I don't think so, but Nate or Chuck may know, may remember. They sent me a, a, a really good data set that goes back to, I'm trying to remember the start date, is it 2007? And I don't remember offhand when round pond two was uh, stopped pumping. So maybe I'll, maybe I'll ask them. I don't think I've ever seen round round pond uh, two data. Okay. Do you remember the year, Nate, when it was stopped pumping offhand? I want to say it was like 20 years ago. Okay. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Give or take, you know. Yeah. So one imagines that somebody somewhere has paper records, but uh, it wouldn't wouldn't surprise me if they're hard to pin down. Um, I don't suppose you have any memory of 1990s work. Never mind. I know that's a <laughs> sumptuous question. <laughs> and I know you didn't focus particularly on gravelly and, and the wells out there. OK, well, that's helpful. Um, um, Again, looking forward to your final report. Uh, we we uh, now will turn to some updates from the working groups, if any. Um, Gordon and uh, <clears throat> Jessica. Yeah. Um, before. Yeah. So our team has, I think, gotten our draft recommendations finalized. So we would love to send it to this group. Um, you know, after this meeting and maybe have some time at the next meeting to get feedback from people if that, if that sounds okay. I don't know what the best approach for that would be, but we'd love input from the broader group. Um, yeah, I think it's an excellent idea to send it out in advance, let people uh, mull on it and then come, come and discuss it in three weeks. Okay. And from our team, were there any outstanding questions that we had for anybody on this call? Um, as we pass the middle of uh, January and get close to the end, you have any, anybody have any idea when the EPA is going to drop this shoe and tell us what their current belief is about safe levels of PFAS in drinking water? It's I in the process. The, what I heard was the EPA expects the whole program to be rolled out and implemented by the end of 2024. And they're looking to do it at in three phases going forward. And what, what's in the whole program? Do you know, Peter? I, I'm not sure. I, I think I expect this. It's adding additional EFERS and maybe lowering levels of some of the other ones. So should we assume that they have uh, relaxed despite all their publicity about uh, end of the year or certainly in January, publishing uh, new levels, at least for the, the big six? I, I've, I heard, think, I've heard like, March. But they'll be able to. Okay. <laughs> Chuck's heard March. It's like the ever ever receding deadline. <laughs> okay. Um, anything else from working groups? Steve, just okay. as a, a comment, um, groups one and one and six had a joint meeting where we had 
<clears throat> reviewed Steve's slides before, that he took to the select board <clears throat> and started to work on some recommendations. And we have another joint meeting scheduled for next Wednesday at 2.30 in the afternoon, which will be in room seven and be virtual, where we'll be <clears throat> continuing to finalize some of the recommendations so, um, that we have. So actually getting the recommendations from group four out <clears throat> so everybody could look at it would allow to see if our recommendations will mesh with any of theirs. Yeah, good point. And of course, everyone is welcome to uh, attend in person or, or on Zoom. Uh, it's a public <laughs> meeting, but particularly if you have uh, an opinion and, and uh, suggestions, now is the right time to bring them to the table. It's a happy little group. Yeah, trying to bring ourselves to some recommendations. Well, on behalf of, of Group One, I've done a little bit more due diligence on a couple of fronts. One is the uh, question of what are what do case studies tell us about um, users' reactions to changes in the price of water? And uh, as Scott's uh, grad students reported, there isn't very much evidence in uh, this part of the country. Uh, although there is evidence in the dry areas of the US where this is more of a you know chronic perennial problem. It's not simply that you have a drought, you have a shortage of water even when you're not having a drought. So conservation has been an ongoing, ongoing issue. So there's some material there. And in the course of that, I came across some very sophisticated models for uh, they don't tell you what elasticity is, but if you want to put in a number for how people will respond to price changes, namely elasticity of demand, and all kinds of details about the uh, distribution of your users and their monthly or quarterly usage rates, um, the models will um, crank out uh, what kinds of uh, monthly usage and revenue impact you should expect. So those are very useful. Unfortunately, the um, the ones developed privately are quite expensive, but it turns out that DEP has a quite sophisticated, although it's about 15 years old, but, but it looks to me to be a quite sophisticated modeling tool that's available for free. So I've downloaded it and stared at it. It, it requires dozens of inputs. So it's not uh, to be sort of, you can't just throw numbers in it and see what it predicts. Um, but it's a, it's a definitely a tool that uh, we could be using and, and perhaps, you know, for all I know, I haven't asked Chuck or Nate about uh, their awareness of it, but you may already have, have uh, seen it and kicked the tires on it. Uh, the second thing is that uh, I've begun looking for examples close to home of installation of smart meters, digital meters that report uh, pretty much in real time through a, a connection, which includes uh, information going into the cloud, which could be accessed by users using apps on their smartphone or their computer. And there are a number of towns uh, that have done this, um, some of them smaller like us, and uh, one in particular I reached out to was Belmont, although it has about three times as many users um, and it is an MWRA town. So it has never really had to, uh, to lower the, put strict limits on for drought. However, over uh, a three year period just ended, uh, they upgraded all their meters from uh, conventional mechanical so-called AMR meters, which are, can be read automatically, but, but not in real time um, to digital meters. And I'm hoping that we can get some, uh, some actual user experience from them. Um, on top of that, uh, Chuck and Nate are not surprisingly further on down the road than we are. They've uh, spoken to vendors already uh, have some estimates of what uh, this could cost the town. Um, it's not huge, but it's not insignificant uh, and how long it would take. 
Uh, so we're going to be folding all of that that in rough order of magnitude is, you know, the experience in Belmont with just over 7,000 meters replaced was that it was around just under $400 a meter, including the central functions of collecting the data and processing it at their water department. Uh, it'd probably be somewhat higher per meter for us because we we're one third their size. Uh, but just as a, a, a kind of a benchmark and they did it over three year period and uh, found it not, not a big challenge. It's kind of a half an hour install um, with uh, you know, no, no great difficulty for anybody who has an existing meter. Um, I think that's it for, for uh, demand side. Although I have been uh, courtesy John Round, we've been getting some questions from other select board members, which I take as a very good sign. Uh, they have a lot to learn compared to you know, the ground we've already covered, but uh, they're, they're, uh, they're asking the right questions. Fairly imaginative questions like, how, how do you compare per capita usage in a town that has 100% of the residences on uh, town water with, other suburbs that may have 30 or 40% of uh, residences on private drinking wells. And the answer is you don't count the residences on private systems. It's only those using the public system. Okay, um, let's turn to um, this draft of preliminary findings and recommendations. Um, this should have gone out to you. I queued it up so it would go out after the meeting started. So I don't expect anybody to have actually read it. Now, let me just make sure that happened. No. no, it doesn't look like it did. So much for delayed send, right? <laughs> so let me just take a moment and make sure this goes to everybody. Um, Okay, there we go. Anyway, we, this draft evolves, you know, day to day and week to week. And uh, as I said, we'll be working on it uh, pretty intently next week in this joint meeting of groups one and six with anybody else who wants to attend. But I thought I would put up the current state of the recommendations um, and see how that looks to people and what you might want to say about it right now. When you see the email, you'll realize that uh, What's up, bud? this stuff is... Uh, you look tired. You gotta go put on jams. There we go. Okay, so it's got a couple of pages of findings. Uh, again, attempting to be succinct, I'll just read you the bolded sections. Task Force on Supplies finds that an additional source of drinking water is imperative. Uh, we're kind of echoing what uh, DEP and EPA have been uh, shouting at us, at least over the past year. Second, on uh, demand, the Task Force finds that programs and incentives to conserve drinking water are imperative. Um, Task Force finds that immediate action on the contaminants, PFAS and others is imperative. We cannot kick the can down the road. On collaboration, initiating collaboration with Hamilton is imperative. And in addition, we must pursue Gordon College restrictions on developing their major parcel. That I realize is a long shot, but it, you don't get there if you don't try. On engagement, we need simple, clear, more frequent public communications, particularly about conserving drinking water and especially as we mount conservation efforts. And in terms of responsibility, we find that new approaches to taking responsibility and tracking accountability are imperative in order to implement our recommendations that end up being adopted by select board and possibly town meeting. So those are all up for uh, revision. You know, get out your red pencils and if you like, mark it up and tell me what you think. 
Uh, I think there's 11 recommendations here. The first one is to improve the water bills. Um, number one, put them in gallons instead of cubic feet. People don't understand cubic feet intuitively. Everybody knows what a gallon is. They buy gasoline, they buy bottled water, et cetera. Um, display a history of usage and benchmarks so that you have some uh, grounding and uh, issue bills monthly, um, which if we do it on by mail is gonna be expensive. So uh, that obviously is gonna require thinking about some incentive to automate, move online, you know, have a, a method where people can click to pay, which isn't onerous. Acknowledging that not everybody's gonna accept that. Maybe even a small incentive to switch to more frequent billing. Second, replace all users' meters with digital smart meters. That's gonna require upgrading data collection and software for billing and reporting usage. It's gonna enable cloud apps for users to get real-time information about their water usage. Um, I would say prioritize the meter replacement for the largest users um, and include what, uh, what's, um, Sarah Creighton calls forensic diagnostics. So uh, an offer of detecting leaks and uh, testing whether metering is actually working for selected large users. And third, and then I'll stop and get your comments to step up conservation education initiatives and engagement of citizens and businesses. We have outside resources we can utilize, the uh, energy and environmental affairs, in the state, the EPA, Greenscapes we belong to. Second, develop a specific communication strategy for the largest users. For example, monthly progress updates to remind and nudge, particularly during summer and droughts. And to consider customized conservation goals for the largest users to enable us to uh, reinforce uh, that they're not getting close to their goal or give recognition when they are. And I guess I would jump to uh, six as part of the conservation, modify the water and sewer rates to promote conservation. First would be to reduce the number of rate tiers. We don't need five or six. Uh, many towns just have three, four might be more suitable. Let's debate that. Uh, second, significantly increase the rates for the highest or the higher tiers of usage. Uh, and then obviously closely monitor the effects because the uh, research we've done demonstrates that we aren't gonna get this right the first time. And it's gonna be a case of uh, continuous improvement. So th those together, one, two, three, and six are uh, focusing on demand and, and the, what we call the customer experience. Any immediate reactions to those? Steve, this is Peter. I have a question. I was going to uh, call Greenscapes uh, for the meeting next week. Um, my understanding is that each member is allotted 500 copies of their literature. Um, and we may be charged for additional copies. And there may be a lead time. They may have to reprint. What should I ask for? 20, 2,500 copies? Is that a reasonable number? You get um, a yeah, the, the number of town reports and town report packets that go out is around 2,200 to 2,250. Yeah, makes sense. There's 2,000 accounts, 1,900 to 2,000 yeah. accounts in uh, residential water. All right, um, so I'll, I'll get quotes for 2,500 then? Yeah, why don't you? And, and uh, can people take a look at that collateral just by going to Greenscapes, North Shore Greenscapes.org? Yes. Okay. So if you get a moment, please do that. So uh, the target would be to get those out with the distribution ahead of the April 3rd town meeting. It's a good idea. Yeah, and I'm sure if they need to, we may be, we may be pushing uh their their system so i wanted to yep. kind of get, yep. get the radar pretty soon 
good thinking. Okay, let me continue. Um, number four is basically an endorsement, maybe a, a possibility of accelerating the replacement of water pipes and valves in the in the public system and to continue detecting leaks. I mean, this is just a all around good thing for us to do in terms of efficiency, reducing water loss, uh, improving our statistics and, and uh, you know, running a tighter ship. And uh, it'd, be, it'd be lovely if we could, uh, if, it's, uh, if it's possible, Chuck and Nate, you can report some, uh, some specific um, positive effects from the work so far. I believe you can, but I'll leave that to you. Yeah, I'm working on the ASR where we just need the last quarter of uh, billing for you know the residential billing. And so um, I need that data before I can give like kind of a big picture view of where we're at. So it, we're, I'm a couple of weeks away from having good information. Okay, super. Um, number five is to install, and this is the proposal Dana gave us some time ago, two monitoring wells on our land uh, between the Hamilton landfill and Gravelly Pond, you know, at sites recommended by Dana and Scott in order to monitor the levels of contaminants in and near our drinking water and maybe give us some information about the fluctuations in height uh, and other parameters for the groundwater there. Um, and make sure that that information goes back to select board, finance, planning, CBA, CONCOM, so that we uh, it has a little bit more visibility uh, for the people who are, you know, probably most inclined to pay attention to the volunteers and elected officials. Um, we talked about six already. Uh, seven is to revise our water protection districts based on some new findings. Uh, which you've just seen uh, last last meeting and this meeting. Um, while we recognize that practical effects of changing those boundaries will be minimal, because first of all, it's not our town. Our bylaws don't actually apply in Hamilton. Hamilton's bylaws apply in Hamilton. And secondly, it's, it's mainly our land. So unless we're planning to turn around and build a you know, a, a big residential complex there, uh, nobody's gonna develop it. So it really does put the onus more on number eight, which is to start much more effective collaboration with Hamilton and also with Gordon as the major landowner in our watershed um, to protect the reservoir and, and the wells out there. So my sense is that the conversations that have gone on already this second bullet, uh, CONCOM every few years has had a conversation going back to uh, Helen Bethel's uh, chair, chairing the CONCOM some decades ago. And they've been polite and um, pretty ineffectual conversations because Gordon doesn't have any interest in uh, kind of giving away rights to that land. And we didn't come with uh, a checkbook to, uh, to pay for conservation restrictions. So that we can leap, take off from that point. Gordon clearly wants to find some way to make that land valuable and realize the value. Um, with Hamilton, you know, we have the, the use and disposition of Tobacco Road, which I, I know, I'm sure that Hamilton DPW would still prefer to pay if they can. Um, the likelihood that, especially if you pave that road, there will be more residential development out there um, and the cap landfill uh, which is you know it's kind of a the classic sunk cost it's it's there and can't be moved and, you know may, may be very difficult to remediate um, a lot to talk about and it seemed to me the missing conversation level is between elected officials because I believe there's pretty regular and an effective conversation between uh, DPW, town engineer, on both sides of this fence. One way to do this might be to um, have a representative, invite a representative from Hamilton and conceivably one from Gordon, 
to participate in some kind of ongoing thing. And I just grabbed the name that Belmont is using. Belmont is using something called a water advisory board. And they created it when they did what we have done, which is they um, abolished the Water and Sewer Commission and folded it into their select board. But when they did that, they recognized that the select board probably didn't have the bandwidth to uh, pay much attention to water usage uh, and fees and other things. And they created a, a three person volunteer group chosen by the select board called the Water Advisory Board. So it's just a model of how to get something that's more or less permanent. Now I know that when we uh, suggested starting re restarting the Water Protection Task Force or committee actually that existed in 1990 and never was actually abandoned or retired. It just kind of faded away um, after a few years. Uh, when we suggested reviving that, the, the select board was pretty adamant that the last thing the town needs is another standing committee that has to be staffed by a limited number of volunteers. But I think the evidence of the task force is that there's there are new and, and uh, capable energetic uh, faces that could get involved in some respect in something that was ongoing. So that's why it's a potential recommendation. Now, number nine is, is the, uh, the sort of the, the big event, the strategic reconfiguration. And the recommendation would be seriously considerate, meaning let's develop a pretty robust comparison of the costs and benefits uh, for the short, medium, and long term of this kind of alternative. This is a one-two punch. Number one is to create a new source of drinking water near Round Pond, which would be cleaner over the longer term than Lincoln Street Well. Reuse the abandoned tubular well field, pros and cons about that, obviously, or get permission to sink a new well. And in the course of that, consider a direct connection between that water source and the treatment plant uh, as part of the capital investment in the, in the thing. It would be over land we own. There'd be conservation issues, of course, but uh, it's not, it wouldn't, wouldn't be a terrible distance happening. And the second step would be once that new source is assured in terms of regulatory permissions and feasibility, capital costs, then plan to retire the Lincoln Street well before it becomes too costly to ensure its quality. And you know, I am I'm speculating, informed speculation here is that a well in, in downtown that's being impacted by an endemic contaminant that has no point source that comes out of how we build things, the furniture we buy, the clothing we wear, the food we eat, the pharmaceuticals we take, the cars we drive, um, we would be much better off investing in a well that's far away from those sources, uh, if only a couple of miles, uh, versus one that's right in the middle of them. Um, I did a quick scan of Eastern uh, Massachusetts, and there are some other towns that have wells fairly close to downtown, but I didn't find any that are kind of right in the middle of schools and small businesses and, and uh, old residences the way Manchester's is. Uh, but so it's, it's not totally unique, but you know, this is a case where you can apply some common sense and say, you know, if we could choose, if, if the cost was a wash over the next 10 years between cleaning up the Lincoln Street well and keeping it clean versus uh, permitting, building and connecting up a new well, which would you choose? What does your common sense tell you? Um, anyway, that's the argument for the serious consideration. Uh, the last two are about responsibility. So create some ongoing capabilities with town, within town government. One of the findings that you saw in the, in the presentation of the select board was that if history is, is uh, our guide, then this issue is gonna fade away over the next year or two, unless some part of town government is charged with keeping it alive and, and uh, implementing the results. 
so there's some models used successfully in other towns. I cited Belmont, kind of splitting the difference and creating a new smaller volunteer group without the powers of the water and sewer. So I understand that water and sewer commissioners essentially own a system that is not officially part of the town government and they make decisions about it, report to the state um, uh, with a dotted line to the town. This would be something that's clearly under the auspices of the select board. And second, to, to um, provide a budget, which we need to uh, guesstimate about for appropriate staff within town government and for outside support and essential consultants, engineers, and geologists. Uh, and 11 uh, just developed plans. I had said 10-year plans, and, and Chuck wisely said, why stop at 10 years? <laughs> you should at least do the skeleton of a 25 and a 50-year plan if that's your uh, your uh, the range of your vision um, on the questions that you can foresee. Uh, and then we would work to get the 10-year plan improved and, and implemented. That one, I think we can we can draft to a certain level of detail. I, I frankly don't know what we're gonna put in 25 or 50 year plan, but it'd be fun to sort of work on the exercise. So let me shut up there and, and uh, again, tell me your reactions. John, you've had your hand up for a while. I'm sorry. It's not um, yeah, yeah, Steve, I wanted to go back to um, Hamilton. And I, it, maybe it relates to this, maybe it does not, but Hamilton of course has water problems because they're in the Ipswich Basin. But part of their land does come over to the coastal basin. And I'm just wondering if they've ever explored drilling a well somewhere around Shabaco Road or even on our land uh, that we own that is in Hamilton. They've certainly to... explored sharing our water, meaning the current supplies and sources. Right. Um, they were told in the report that came out in August last year, the consultants under the grant from the WMA, the state uh, water people, they were told that it would be extraordinarily difficult to get permits for a new well extracting significant water from the aquifers around Chebacco, given that Essex is already reliant on the wells, you know, east of Chebacco Lake, and we're pretty reliant on the wells uh, and, and surface water of Gravelly Pond. So they they would regard that sub basin, the so-called North Coastal sub basin, as a threatened source of water, and drawing more out of it would. Uh, All right. Well, that's, a, might that's that, yeah. That's another point that perhaps could be put in here. If the, I did not know that that was in fact a statement that was made as part of that study, because, of course, we've been using a great deal of water, and frankly, it's been fine. But what you're telling me is that the report says that if you put another community to draw some part of it onto that, uh, then it becomes uh, perhaps threatened. Yeah, that of course was an opinion from the consultants, but they obviously okay. deal with, they deal with okay. the EP. Yeah. It was also right. somewhat entangled in the, it was part of their examination of the possibility of collaboration between Manchester and Hamilton to maybe supply half of or conceivably all of Hamilton's water use. They looked at both those alternatives. And part of the difficulty in permitting comes from our uh, awful uh, performance in the eyes of, of DEP and, and uh, the state water people. So mm -hmm. it, it, they said explicitly, it's unlikely that you know, there'd be another permit to extract more water from North Coastal Basin, either from Hamilton or Manchester, as long as Manchester's, you know, wasting so much and and using so heavily at the at the meters. Okay, just was. But there are, other, there are other ways to collaborate. One thing that struck me when I looked at Belmont, with three times as many users and therefore, you know, a bit, an ability to share the. The fixed costs of doing a, a significant upgrade like digital meters. Why not invite Hamilton to do it with us? Share a central data source. The per meter course's cost is going to be the same, but uh, I think Chuck and Nate have pointed to some pretty significant, you know, quarter to half a million dollar uh, central 
facilities and software communication, distributed communication data. Well, it's it's always something to revisit, especially if we drill these two monitoring wells and find out really what's coming from that landfill that, of course, gets diluted out quite a bit of quite a bit by the time it reaches gravelly pond. And if we wind up seeing something that is challenging, that might be an opportunity to chat with them again. Yeah, one hopes so. Okay, um, thanks, John. Uh, I also wanted to raise uh, something a little more uh, urgent in terms of uh, the deadline, which is uh, we need to get a number to uh, to Greg Federspiel and the select board, which would roughly say what what it would cost to pursue these, assuming some some or all of these recommendations get enacted. What would it cost to to stay on task? And I've been thinking about that uh, in several terms. One is um, continue having some level of staffing, such as Sue Croft has been providing. I don't know whether we actually have to budget that or whether it, uh, it's kind of a shared resource, but that's one important resource for continuing work. The second is to um, have some level of assistance from Scott and conceivably from some specialists in uh, conservation rates and how to implement them. Um, several of us are meeting uh, Friday with a group that Scott identified whose business includes a, a specialization in helping municipalities uh, implement intelligent water, sewer, and stormwater rates. Just to sound them out, see what, you know, what kind of role they could take and what kind of assistance they could give. And a, a third is um, conceivably to have some capabilities, some human resources that could do some of the work that would otherwise fall in DPW from these recommendations. Um, and I, you know, I don't want to put words in Chuck's mouth, but I'm, I know there are some areas here which can only be done right if DPW manages them, you know, 100%. There are other areas probably where like analyzing the result of conservation rates where having a small budget for an analyst to do that work um, mm. would make a lot of sense. I do that, I, the numbers I come up with are very, very uh, vague. It looks like we might have $10,000 to, to ask to carry over from the 80,000 appropriate for this uh, first year uh, or to the end of the, task force. And then uh, round numbers, are, these are guesstimates. Something like $50,000 of outside assistance over a year, including the monitoring wells. Um, something like $50,000 for staffing, meaning people who get paid to do analysis and and uh, collect information. And uh, so I keep coming up with this number of $100,000 or $120,000. And I could sure use some uh, some input and advice about that. But uh, just as, to give you guys a straw man to, to uh, shoot at or set on fire, uh, that's what I came up with. John, is your hand still up about that? No, I. Um... I'm I'm curious about what those numbers are. Um, I think that $100,000 is probably more than the finance committee is interested in dealing with. And I don't know that we necessarily need all of the all of these activities. And we really should put down a list of the tasks that are involved if all of them need to kick in in year one. Because you want to drill some wells. I know that probably doesn't take too much. I don't think you have to stand in line long, but you have to drill them and then set yeah, things that, up. And that's already budgeted, at least the, the initial drilling and monitoring. Yeah. Good point. Scott, your hand is up too. I just wanted to add to, um, you know, in terms of things to think about, uh, 
scheduling is, uh, as Chuck mentioned, um, if, if the town does seriously consider abandoning Lincoln Street, you got to deal with that fire flow issue. And mm -hmm. that's certainly something that I can't help with at all. So I, th so I think um, getting some help on that, at least initially, you could probably get a preliminary analysis. And again, I would defer to Chuck and Nate on that. But I think that's something that that along with re-establishing uh, the round pond too, it seems like an assessment of those two uh, facilities and what the costs are seem to be pretty central to determining the feasibility of that major recommendation of, you know, alternative supply. And I'll just uh, remind people to take a peek at the chat because it's full of really interesting comments from Chuck Nate and others about the wells and the and other and other issues. Um, yeah, that's a really good point. As Chuck has pointed out, there already have been some pressure issues in firefighting in East Manchester, and uh, we don't want to make those worse. We, we can we like actually to make them better. Okay, well, um, we're down to our last nickel of time here. So I, I want to move us to uh, any changes to the minutes from January 4th meeting. I had only one to suggest, which is we should note the time we adjourned, which I think is traditionally 8.30. Any other suggestions? Could I hear a motion to accept those amended minutes? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. And now I will unshare so that I can actually see most of you. And let me just go around the table uh, and ask for uh, ayes or nays. Uh, John Round? Aye. Uh, David Lumsden? Aye. Jessica Lamont? Aye. Mike Carvalho? Aye. Gordon Turner? Aye. Jeff Koshan? Aye. Ron Masto Dracamo? Aye. Peter Calaruso? Aye. And I think that, no, oh, Tom Kehoe? Aye. I think that's uh, members, not alternates, but if I made a mistake, um, any any member I've missed, please make a joyful noise. Okay, it is unanimous. Um, in terms of the next meeting, let's just take a peek at the calendar. Uh, three weeks would be February 15, I think. Is there any uh, serious objection? So February 15, 7 p.m. Hearing none. That'll be when our next meeting takes place and we will look forward to going over uh, both the report and rec findings and recommendations from uh, team four, the contaminants group and uh, whatever emerges from team one and six and anyone else who joins us for the public meeting next week. Uh, in the meantime, please take a look when you get a chance uh, at what I'm emailed to you, which is what I showed you on the screen and uh, get out your red pen. Any final comments, questions? Steve, is everyone else getting that email? Because I don't see it yet on mine. I don't have it well, either. I'm sorry, it's probably my mistake. Every time I queue up something for delayed send, it goes into some kind of limbo in Outlook world on my computer. So as soon as we hang up, I will disassemble Outlook, punish it severely, and force <laughs> it to send you this email. Okay. I just wanted to make sure it wasn't just me. No, I don't think it is. I see it parked here in the outbox, kind of thumbing its little email nose at me. All right, no problem. Uh, thank you all for continued good work. And uh, let's bring this ship into dock. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Good night. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, everybody.